the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Hard to believe that these 28 words could be so divisive, could be challenged, could take decades to become law, and could provide so much hope and promise. Yet these words that are the 19th Amendment and became law in 1920 have both delivered and disappointed to the in the hundred years since its passage. This fight for equal rights over the past hundred years is the subject of Elizabeth Griffith's new comprehensive and revealing book, Formidable American Women in the Fight for Equality, 1920 to 2020. Dr. Griffiths is an historian, an educator, and has been a Kennedy Fellow at Harvard, a Klingenstein Fellow at Columbia, and has written extensively for the New York Times, the Washington Post, and others on the issue of women's history. Even for those of us who have been alert and active in the women's movement for over 50 years, I learned a ton and have a wider view of all the activists, black and white, who have worked tirelessly to achieve what we have, even if we know it isn't still enough. Betsy, welcome to Just the Right Book. Hi, Roxanne. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to meet you. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Um, so when was the language of the 19th Amendment first introduced? That language, the language you just quoted, was introduced in 1878 by the senator from California. It was called the Anthony Amendment. There's some irony there because Susan mm. B. Anthony did not attend the Seneca Falls meeting at which Elizabeth Cady Stanton proposed that women should get the vote. But it um, that suggests, though, from the 1870s to 1920, what a long fight it was. And it was a a two-tier fight, a three-generation and two-tier fight. Suffragists were trying to win the vote at the state level and at the national level with a national amendment. And it required victories in both of those um, venues in order to get it passed um, by 1920. And what was it that made the tipping point of it getting passed in 19? 20 unique to 1920 that hadn't happened for the previous 42 years? Well, enough, um, enough elements came together under the direction of Carrie Chapman Catt, who was president of the National American Woman Suffrage Association. Catt was a brilliant political strategist and she was able to run this two level campaign working with the working state by state to make sure that uh, women were earning suffrage at the state level. By 1919, women had suffrage in, 20, in, in 27 states representing 6 million women. So that meant that the representatives of 27 states and the House and the Senate knew that women might be voting for them. So that would influence their vote on a national amendment. At hmm. the same time, she brought enormous pressure on the Congress to um, bring it up and to pass it. It had been defeated every other time it had been voted on until um, mid-1919. It was defeated because brewers and saloon keepers and Democratic um, urban politicians were against it. It was defeated because uh, manufacturers were worried that women would press for progressive reforms for workers um, in factories. It was defeated by Southerners who were opposed to any expansion of the vote that might um, lead to more African-Americans voting. It had enormous opposition. But Kat's careful strategy, running opponents against the people who opposed her, winning state by state, she also, um, the, well, the war, the first, the Great War, the First World War helped a lot because women, even though it was a brief war for us, women um, volunteered in factories and in farms and overseas. They were essential in our war effort, and that made general voters take them more seriously. Uh, but the most important thing was that women were voting uh, and that Wilson finally came around and called it a war measure. 
but it was really Kat's pressure and, and bringing together a huge um, alliance of probably 2 million women who were, um, a, they had uh, various ethnicities and races and languages and ages. Um, and by pulling together this coalition, which really only lasted for three years from 1917 until the passage, um, they were able to put on enough pressure that it passed both the House and the Senate. It was very hard going. And then, of course, you know, in a ratification and to get a constitutional amendment passed, you need two thirds vote in both the House and the Senate. And then you need ratification by three quarters of the states, which at that time, 48 states, 36 needed to ratify. And it came down to 35 and a half, came down to the state of Tennessee, and the Senate had affirmed, but the House, they were worried that they didn't have the vote in the lower house of the Tennessee legislature. And they won by one vote, a vote that was changed by a young man named Harry Byrne, 24 years old. He was a Republican from East Tennessee in his first term, and he intended originally to oppose it, but then he got a letter from his mother, dear Harry, be a good boy, support Mrs. Cat and vote for ratification. So Love thanks it. to one vote by one man, and keep mm. in mind, every vote cast was by a white man, um, but Harry's final vote enfranchised 27 million American women. And without him, they would have had to start all over again. Well, so a couple of things I want to go back and unpack. So one is, one of the things I found interesting is that when you talked about that of the seven states that could have uh, been the deciding factor, for a variety of reasons, all these other states were off the table and, and it only came down to Tennessee. So what was that about? Roxanne, you know, I had technical difficulties before and we had to go to my phone and you said I could interrupt if I needed to. Sure. So my screen, my screen is flashing that I have low power. So I need to go get the plug for my phone. So okay. can we pause for one moment? Yes, we can. I apologize. No problem. So for those of you listening, <laughs> um, what we've ended up with a series of unfortunate incidents. One is I left my phone at home. The building uh, that I record in, the door was locked. Um, and I obviously couldn't call anybody. I didn't have a phone. And then I, you know, dash up here. I did manage to get in some extra steps. And Elizabeth had a computer that crashed. So we guided her, Julie Gordon guided her to her phone. And now she's plugging in her phone. Okay. So. That All gives right, you a little I bit of apologize background. enormously. I've never had so many technical glitches on the same day. Don't worry Don't about worry. it. Don't worry about it. Okay, so let's go back. Um, it, you would you would uh, given us. You think a background. That, do you think they heard the question? Do they think they heard your question? I'm going to come back to it. Okay. Um, so I want to unpack a couple of things in what you uh, just talked about. One is you talk about that there were some divisive coalitions. Um, there was Kat's uh, approach, Kat's approach. There was Alice Paul who had a different approach. And then there was the, the black women who were looking for a wider sense of protection than I'm using the term merely advisedly, but merely the vote. So share with us, Betsy, what those different factions were about and how, at least fleetingly, Cat managed to, I, I hate to use this pun, herd the cats. So Black women in the, in the, in the few years leading up to the success of the 19th Amendment in August 1920, on the whole, Black political women were allied with Carrie Chapman Catt. She um, purposely included them as she did immigrant women and Jewish women and working women. She was very purposeful in creating this coalition. 
and Alice Paul um, was much more reluctant to include black women. And that would continue after ratification when she, uh, when the National Women's Party would propose the Equal Rights Amendment. It was pretty much a white only party. So let's stick with, at the moment, let's stick with Kat and Paul. Yeah. Kat and Paul represent the second and third generation of the three generations that got suffrage passed. The first generation are the founders, Stanton, Anthony, Lucy Stone, Sojourner Truth, Ellen Watkins Harper, um, black and white women who after 1870 and some fights about the 15th amendment would divide and have their own separate segregated paths. The role of racism in this history of women is, is deep and disturbing. But by the, by the period that you're talking about, right before ratification, Kat was able to um, align with the major um, African-American women's organizations. Paul, younger, um, had, been, uh, had lived in England doing research for her graduate degree from the University of Pennsylvania. She had worked with the British suffragettes, supposed to be American suffragists, and those suffragists were basically domestic terrorists. They were throwing bombs in mailboxes and creating great destruction. Several people died, and Paul, before she came back to America, had been jailed and force-fed seven times. So she was used to a more militant outdoor mm -hmm. approach. She's the one who organizes the parade the day before Wilson's inauguration. She's the one who organizes the pickets of the White House. And she's brilliant at that. And it creates lots of headlines for a federal amendment. But Paul is, really has not won a single vote in the Congress for passage. Um, scholars continue to debate who ought to get credit. I give, lots of, I give more credit to Kat. But I recognize that in any social movement, it's always good to have somebody out in the vanguard sounding outrageous so that when the vote counters come along, they seem more reasonable. And so in a way, it helped Kat that Paul was outrageous, although Kat thought Paul was stupendously stupid because mm. she brought a parliamentary point of view. She only wanted to work with one of the political parties and suffrage never would have passed without bipartisan support. So that's the first part of your question, the, the different strategies about getting the past. The role of Black women is much more complicated. And I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back uh, to that. But, you know, one of the things I thought about uh, as I was reading the book is there's a quote from a 19th century humorist that I often think about. And the quote, I don't even remember his name. But the quote was that as Americans, we love live conformists and dead nonconformists. You know, <laughs> we know we need the nonconformists to produce progress, but we hate all the ruckus they raise contemporaneously. And Alice Paul made me think about that, that, you know, she was driving everybody crazy, but there was a piece of what she was doing that was a contributing factor. Right. You just didn't want her making a mess in your living room. And Roxanne, you're exactly right. It's an issue that continues today. Is it better to go to the protest on the National Mall on a Saturday or is it better to be going door to door in your state asking for support for your candidate or for your issue? Yeah, um, I'm I'm more in the door knocking, although I've done plenty of marching and protesting in my life as well. Yeah, I, I've been a door knocker, but um one of the other uh, things that I want to get to that I think people often forget, um, or I shouldn't assume other people forget, I'll say I forget, um, and that is it was predominantly the Republicans, right? Now, Lincoln was a Republican, yes, and it was predominantly Republicans that were in support of the 19th Amendment. And in fact, you know, Lincoln's um, heirs were obviously in favor of civil rights. So share with us, just to sort of fertilize the ground, what the Republican and Democratic parties each represented in 1920. And when did they flip? And what drove the flip? You're exactly right in your characterization that in 1920, while Republicans had conservative elements who were blocking suffrage, mostly in states with large manufacturing 
um, power. Uh, a lot of the West was Republican and it was quite progressive and liberal. The Democratic Party was dominated by Southern Democrats because um, they weren't allowing blacks to vote. They had enormous power to be reelected. They grew then in, in um, authority and dominance, they completely dominated the Senate so that the Senate could filibuster any progressive issue. And it was being filibustered by white male segregationists. Um, and Wilson, who's viewed as such a, um, I think many people, non-historians view him as a liberal good guy president. And he did um, pass several progressive issues, but he was beholden to the Southern Senate and he was himself a Southerner born and bred. And so he had some conservative attitudes. He's the person who segregated the federal government which had been um, um, integrated up until Wilson's administration uh, and, and did nothing for blacks during his term and very little for women. He was very reluctantly pulled into suffrage at the, at the close to the end of his second term. Um, so blacks were very wary of Democrats and would not vote, um, were not going to vote for the Democratic Party and continued to be suppressed by the Democratic Party. It's not until, it's even after 1936, it's probably by the, well, maybe the second election, definitely the third election of uh, Franklin Roosevelt that Mrs. Roosevelt's efforts on behalf of African-Americans and other vulnerable people in our country began to prompt them to question their allegiance. Um, you might remember that Roosevelt's first vice president was John Nance Garner, who was from Texas. And so black voters would have seen him as a threat to them. Um, but then he changes vice presidents as he moves along. And Mrs. Roosevelt really pressed very hard to make sure that blacks were included in as many New Deal um, depression recovery programs as possible. The other thing that's happening, um, I'm, I'm sure many of your listeners and your readers and your bookstore patrons have read Isabel Wilkerson's, um, oh, I've forgotten her title, about the great the migration. Chaos. Oh, about oh the, yeah. The, um, the Warmth of Other Suns, thank you. The right. Warmth of Other Suns, in which um, uh, a huge population of African-Americans beginning around 1915 begin to migrate to Los Angeles, Chicago, Detroit, New York, Washington, DC. And so that's moving them into the North where they are also confronted by um, racism and prejudice, but they are not confronted by the same kind of violence and death threats and, and reality of murder that they had to deal with in the South. And so as they move into a broader geography, they are voting for white politicians and eventually they'll be voting for black politicians, publishing newspapers, um, electing aldermen and state legislatures. Um, so black political power is shifting outside of the South and that has influence that will be positive for them as well. And, in, and, and either they're having influence on Republican and Democratic um, members of Congress in the North or they are or they are beginning to run for those offices. Yeah, and we'll we'll come to another piece of that uh, if we have time, but thank you uh, for that. So we referred earlier that black women were fighting not only for the right to vote, but also to be protected from general violence and to to make the point, I was sort of stunned about this, um, that Eleanor Roosevelt in January of 1939 publicly condemned lynching, which, which seems like a no brainer, right? I mean, how would you not condemn lynching? Yet shock, you share in the book that shockingly between 1882 and 1933, 61 anti-lynching bills had been introduced and defeated. And between 1934 and 1940, 130 more bills were introduced and even FDR did not endorse. I mean, how, I, 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 can't, I can't even get my brains around the idea that an anti-lynching bill couldn't pass. I mean, it, it, an anti-lynching bill would not be supported 
by those Southern senators. It went it lost in the Senate every single time. And the bill that might have, that had the best chance of passing was to um, charge the, the sheriffs in Southern towns who did not protect people in their jails from being dragged out and lynched illegally. But even that bill did not pass. And FDR needed those Southern senators to pass his New mm. Deal legislation. So he sold his soul. Um, and uh, not only on that, on other issues as well. Yeah. If, and very few people were speaking out against lynching. It was rampant. But your original point, Roxanne, is exactly right. White women wanted the rights that white men had. Black women not only wanted those rights, but they had a much broader agenda. They down to the very basis of protecting their families, their communities, their relatives from the threat of lynching. And it was it was um, horrible that it happened so often, so frequently, um, so cruelly. And and the so the women get the vote. What happens? Do, do we start to see like women coming out in droves to vote? Are they like, is everything now upended? We, you know, there's like, you know, the sun, whatever the saying is about, you know, the sun on the mountain. I mean, it, the, they had fought for so long. Now it happens. What's the result? And, and they don't show up at the polls. So Why? Let's, let's first talk about the, the 19th Amendment is an incomplete victory. It enfranchises white women and black women, but it does not protect black women in the places they're living in the South. They're not allowed to register. They're not allowed to vote. All of the discriminatory practices that were applied to black men trying to vote were applied to black women. And black women appeal to their white women former allies to help them out, and they do not. It's not only Alice Paul, who was particularly racist in her uh, response, wow. but, th but the League of Women Voters, other groups are not. The 19th Amendment has also left out Native Americans, all kinds of immigrants, women married to foreigners. There's a lot of people who were not included. But among the people who were included, the majority of white women in this country do not flock to the polls. Um, the election of 1920 is sort of an anomaly. It's one of the lowest turnout elections in the history of America. The, the electorate has doubled. You have twice as many people possibly voting. Right. And fewer people voted than had um, voted in, for the last century. The, it's hard to, um, for scholars to solve this problem because no one thought to stand at the exits of polls as they do yeah. today and count who was going in or ask the women coming out, why did you vote? Um, there was no counting of women's votes as um, in any way at that time. The scholars have sort of concluded that maybe one third of the total vote in that election had been cast by women, but there's very little data to support that. So the supposition is that women had um, absorbed all of the negative arguments given by the opposition to suffrage for why they shouldn't vote. That it was inappropriate for women to be in the public arena. It was too dirty, messy, fraught. Um, that they would be neglecting their domestic duties. That they would be undermining the authority of their husbands. Um, for many women, it was a question of, of um, money because uh, many states had poll taxes that not only applied to African Americans, but applied to anybody who was poor. And a poll tax could be $10, which was a lot of money. In 1920, many white men would not have voted if they had to pay that poll tax. Um, the women did not feel qualified to vote. They felt they had not been educated to vote. It's one of the reasons that the, the, the Carrie Chapman cat reluctantly converts her national association, um, the National American Women's Suffrage Association into the League of Women Voters, which becomes this nine nonpartisan good citizenship, let's educate everybody organization. When I think in her heart of hearts, she would have said to them all go run for office. Um, but it was because there was this sense that women were um, not gonna turn out, they didn't feel qualified to vote. And it has enormous consequences. When men thought women were going to vote in the first um, congressional session after the 1920 election, 
quite a lot of things are passed that benefit women. When women do not vote in measurable number in 1922 or 24, those bills are repealed, they're defunded. Mm -hmm. Women, everything that white women had on their agenda in the 1920s is defeated or dead by um, 1930. Yeah, you know, as as a, there are a lot of, I, I wouldn't really call them fun facts, but interesting facts. And one- I like to think they're fun. It's why I yeah. put in the flappers in Miss America. Uh, yeah, like I love that. But yeah, the other, uh, the one of the things, tell me if I'm remembering this right, is so the vote for women uh, passes, and in order to stop blacks from voting, they put in a written literacy law. But at the same time, there was a grandfather clause so that if your grandfather voted, you don't have to pass a literacy test. Yes. Let me let me back up. Um, all that the United States Congress could do or that the 19th Amendment did was sort of extend citizenship rights to women. All the 19th Amendment did was said that you could not discriminate against women. You could not discriminate against any voter on account of sex. It doesn't even say the word women because the word women does not appear in the Constitution, a whole nother topic about originalism. But um, so it meant that states, states set all the rules for voting as they do today. Um, which is why you have all these random rules Lots being set up yeah. about early voting and mail-in voting, all of that. So states could find other ways to keep women from voting and in Southern states to keep blacks from voting. They had literacy tests, grandfather clauses. The grandfather clause was that if your grandparent had been enslaved, you could not vote. So you could, so white, white, illiterate white voters could fail the literacy test, but if their grandparent had been a voter, they could still vote. So it allowed white people who had not had education to vote and black people who had not had education not to vote. Mm. Um, I wanna take a little side trip on the ERA. Um, since the ERA has never passed, um, I'm curious, your thoughts on why hasn't it passed and when was it first introduced and what the hell is the objection to it? <laughs> Roxanne, um, the ERA <laughs> is the brainchild of Alice Paul. Alice Paul has a lot in common with Elizabeth Cady Stanton. She's very broad in her thinking and always outrageous in her approach. So after um, suffrage wins, she takes herself to law school, earns multiple degrees, and thinks what we need is another constitutional amendment that would be a blanket amendment enforcing equal rights for everybody. And um, she pursues her same parliamentary attitude and only has Republicans introduce it. So right off the bat, Democratic progressives don't like it because it's a partisan right. bill. But more importantly, those Democrats were very engaged in social justice issues for immigrants, for factory workers, for poor people. And they believed that an equal rights amendment in 1923 would eliminate some of the protections that had been passed for those workers. And in 1923, you could make the case that those protections were enormously important. But by 1960, 1965, the end of the 60s when the equal rights amendment will actually get through the Congress, labor unions have very reluctantly and slowly changed their attitudes. One of the rules, for example, might have been that women cannot lift more than 30 pounds. And that might have been a good rule in 1923, but in, by, by the end of the 60s, there were a lot of working women who were easily lifting that much in groceries or in children, whatever. Or bookstores. And did not want to be held <laughs> back by those kinds of protective regulations. And the courts had changed their attitudes. For many years, the courts would only allow women workers to be protected because they were potential mothers. By the, by the middle of the 20th century, the court had thrown all that out and said, you need to, if you're going to protect workers, you're protecting both men and women workers with the right number of hours, the right kind of wages, rests, all those things. Um, so the, so it, it was easier to make the case in the 1960s. There is, as I said, there are no, there's no language about um, women's rights in the Constitution. And this was an effort, in addition to the 
um, 14, the, the only place in the Constitution that provides equal protection for all citizens is the first section of the 14th Amendment. That's the equal protection clause that mm -hmm. people hear about. But the court had been very, the Supreme Court had been reluctant to, to um, resolve any issues relating to women's rights based on the 14th Amendment. They are more likely to do it now than they were then, although it's another issue about what they're willing to do now. Um, so in the 1960s, you had, a, you had a variety of things come together. You'd had black women working in the civil rights movement underground quietly, safely as much as they could trying to stay out of the spotlight and the risk of lynching, but they had made enough progress that by the 50s, you have Brown v. Board of Education, the Montgomery bus boycott, you have Emmett Till's murder, you have the Little Rock Nine, the civil rights movement is bursting forth. And white women who are supposedly very happy in their domesticity of homemaking of the 1950s are not all that happy and are paying attention to what's going on in the news and they're thinking about their own lives. Comes to a um, sort of a crisis point in the 1960s when you have uh, Betty Friedan's feminine mystique, you have oral contraception changing people's sex lives, and you have a report by the President's Commission on the Status of Women saying that there is egregious discrimination against women in many statutes in the country, but an equal rights amendment is not the right solution. They said that because the commission had been stacked with anti-ERA people in the Kennedy administration. But that gives the push to push for an equal rights amendment. And it, it passes the Congress with considerable margins in March of 1972. And it's well on its way to ratification. I think 21 states ratified in 1972 alone when um, the Roe decision is handed down in January of 73 and Phyllis Schlafly arises as a powerhouse who will, um, a conservative uh, Republican powerhouse who will who is as effective as Kat was as a political strategist. And she not only um, stops the ERA in its tracks, but she creates a conservative political coalition of disenfranchised white segregationist Democrats, religious conservatives alarmed about Roe, and sort of middle Americans who just thought the 60s had been too wild and too offensive. And she pulls all those people together under what she would call a family um, values uh, coalition, and she hands it to Ronald Reagan. The election mm -hmm. of Ronald Reagan in 1980 really begins the reversal of women's rights in this country that has culminated most recently in the Dobbs decision. So one of the things I thought about in reading the book, and we've got about 12 minutes left, and I've got lots that I think we ought to cover. So I've been an adult since the 1960s. And so I have watched lots of ups and downs of the women's movement and lots of high points like Roe v. Wade um, when I was already out of college uh, when that passed. And yet, which I think you talk about in the book, I mean, I think it's a very important point that the women's movement has never been as unified or inclusive as it should be. But but I, I remember thinking about this because I was at the march in 2017. And actually I was there with Lissa, uh, Muscatine, who I know oh is a friend of yours. And, you know, we're walking around and that felt like a high point to me that the, the energy and the inclusion and the deliberateness just felt like we might be embarking on another burst of progress. And to think that you'd, you know, if you were Rip Van, a, a, a short term Rip Van Winkle and woke up um, in 2022 to find Roe v. Wade overturned, I mean, it, why have we not moved more forward? What is it? that, you know, 
could happen, should happen, hasn't happened, that the game seems long, 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 long. I mean, you're you write about a hundred years, and obviously plenty has happened. But when you looked at it, when you put together this book, Betsy, what stood out to you as like the failings of why more hasn't happened? You go right to the hardest questions, Roxanne. Um, <laughs> That's my job. I think I think um, writing this book forced me to acknowledge yet again how the deep legacy of racism in America, mm -hmm. um, segregation divided two cohorts of progressive women, white and black change agents, who might have accomplished even more together than they did independently. Since the 1960s, there have been clearly more opportunities than that, more opportunities to find alliances and to move ahead. But I think that I think that we are still haunted by patterns of the past. And we're not as used to working in alliance across race and ethnicity as we ought to. Black women do it better than we do, but they have different issues. I think we're still stuck, white women are still stuck in the sort of what does this mean for me? And we've left out a lot of issues that black women would say were feminist issues. Food deserts, homelessness, right. inadequate education, inadequate um, services for many people in this country. So you have a whole, you have different agendas and different ways of approaching them. I think we need to find ways to have the agenda be everybody's agenda and work together where we can because we need all the friends we can get, white, black, and male allies. So that's, so that's one reality that we have to confront. Mm -hmm. And we need to begin to think about who our allies are and to work on increasing the strength of those alliances. And I think that's a responsibility of white women to do the outreach. Yeah. I think that, um, what seems surprising to us because we had become so complacent in all of the advances that women had made in the last 50 years, as had our children, um, that people are surprised now by um, how quickly they can be reversed. There's still some excellent legislation on the books. We still have Title VII, we still have Title IX, we still have pregnancy anti discrimination against pregnant women. We still have credit issues that are all beneficial to women, some educational advances. So there's lots of good stuff, but there's really no opportunity for women to have equality, equal agency, personal freedom, if they do not have reproductive rights. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna respect people who would quote, never have an abortion or don't believe an abortion is an appropriate procedure but I object to their imposing that view on the rest of the country. And I think we need to go, we need to follow Carrie Chapman Catt back to the state legislatures. We need to have a two tier approach, mm -hmm. making sure we're active at, in the state level and paying attention to what's happening in the Congress. Because this country is so divided into its partisan silos and into its news source silos. I'm not even sure I mean, I'm always uncomfortable saying that because I think one silo has actual facts and the other silo has a lot of opinion. We can't even start from the same basis of information. But if we're going to protect all women, we need to be in lots of places where we are not at the moment. Well, you know, I, I of course, agree with you, but I read something the other day and I don't remember the names and I might not even depict uh, the situation right, but I read about a sort of serious disagreement now between feminists who feel that we need to broaden the view of what a female is, and the trans movement feels like that is denigrating to the trans movement. And, uh, you know, I, you and I are not going to solve that discussion today, but it's it, it reminds me that 
in order to get the unity in the coalition that you're talking about, you end up with everybody a little bit unhappy. That that becomes uh, that becomes sort of the defining what's the better whole. Yet, if everybody's going to fight for their individual part, the whole could fall apart. Well, we just need to make sure that the whole is a very inclusive whole. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I don't, there's no reason it shouldn't be. I mean, equal rights, we want to include every single kind of person there is. I know we all stumble over some of the language and some of the ideas. And, um, but, but the basic idea is that um, in America, we believe that every citizen, every human being, every person here um, deserves equal justice and liberty and freedom for all, all those language, all the language that um, we aspire to have be our reality, but we're so far from it. And we need, and when we're thinking about these coalitions, we need to think about what those partnerships are. If mm -hmm. I help you with that, will you help me with this? Um, because we're much stronger when we're, I think when we're in um, unusual and unified coalitions. So and Betsy, of course, who as do a historian, you... I, I think it's good for people to confront discomfort. I sure. Think, uh, the world is full of discomfort. But Betsy, who do you see out there as unifying activist female leaders? Roxanne, I don't have an answer to that at the moment. I'm paying, I was recently at the um, Clinton Library where um, Secretary Clinton convened a women's summit. And one of the things that characterized it was the range of ages of the people on the panels. Mm -hmm. She had young women who had been um, Marjorie Stone and Douglas students who had uh, organized um, uh, protests against gun violence. She had people who were involved in climate issues. I mean, it was just a wide range of issues, all of them women's issues, and a wide range of participants of every single different kind, sexual orientation, ethnicity, languages, whatever. Um, and it demonstrated, A, that everything is a women's issue, and that there are plenty of people working on it. And I really prompted in me enormous admiration for these young people who seem to have, um, who seem to be able to build these coalitions well, yeah. and to understand that there are links between climate change and gun control and women's rights and um, poverty issues. That we that there's a lot to be addressed, and there and there are ways to do it. So it may be time for us to learn from people who are younger than we are. Mm. And Betsy, but are you very? Up? I mean, we are confronted with enormous complexity. Um, and I, and, but I, but I refuse to be um, pessimistic about it. It might have taken a long time to get the vote, but we got the vote. I don't think it's going to take that long to reverse the abortion decisions. Um, I'm sort of pumped up by the possibilities in front of us. Well, you've sort of answered the last question I was going to ask you is, are you optimistic? I'm natural. Well, I love what Madeleine Albright said that that she was both a realist and an optimist. So um, that's a, that's a balancing act because you have to confront what the realities are. But I am, um, you know, in what other country do we have the possibility to make the changes that we could make if we could if if we could create the coalitions and the passion for the changes that are needed. Mm. I hope my book. I hope my book encourages people to take those kinds of actions to take to use these formidable women as an example of courage and integrity. Um, and I go back to courage. I mean, they risked so much to accomplish what they did and we cannot deny that legacy. Well, Betsy, um, and for our listeners, um, it, you know, there's, you know, a abundance of names in your book that are inspiring. You arrange it by periods of time, which I think was an interesting approach instead of organizing it by politics or or education. So there's, you know, there's fun statistics in there, like the marriage rate in 1920 was 92.3. <laughs> um, that about what happened when women got sent back home after World War II saying, you know, thanks for becoming Rosie the Riveter, but the guys are back and you go home and do your like whatever. 
Um, I love the picture of Marilyn Monroe in 1944 at the um, radio plane company. Uh, but you've got, I hope our listeners will pick up the book because I think it does, I think it accomplishes three things. One is there's just a lot of really fascinating history for us to learn. But two is it reminded me it's a long game. It's just a long game and it's hard in the moment to see progress, but, you know, I still want to buy into the arc of time bends towards justice. Yes. And in this case, uh, women's equality and you're, you're a great writer. It was, it was Thank fun you. to read. So what, uh, what I'd like to do is close with um, a, uh, statement that Margaret Chase Smith um, said on the a floor of the Senate in July of 1950, being not surprising, a woman who would would speak up to the bullyism of Joe McCarthy and said this, which made me think not enough has changed. But if I could read her. Uh, statement or a part of her statement. Those of us who shout the loudest about Americanism are all too frequently those who by our own words and acts ignore some of the basic principles of Americanism, the right to criticize, the right to hold unpopular beliefs, the right to protest, the right of independent thought. The Congress has been debased to the level of a forum of hate and character assassination sheltered by the shield of congressional immunity. I speak as a Republican. I speak as a woman. I speak as a United States Senator. I don't want to see the Republican party ride to a political victory on the four horsemen of calumny, fear, ignorance, bigotry, and smear. Somebody could give that talk today and 72 years later. Somebody could give that talk today, but it's unlikely it would be a Republican senator, <laughs> for which I'm very sorry, because well, I like the parties when they had progressives, moderates, and conservatives, and then could come together in the middle and get things done. Yeah. I hope people find formidable or any any study of women's history, as I do, I hope they find it engaging and outraging and motivating because there's so much we don't know and learning it helps us to see the broader picture. I'm so mm. grateful to have been on. Roxanne, thank you. Uh, Betsy, I, 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 I would say on your hope for the book, I, I would check that box as a mission accomplished. Um, and you give honor to all the women, invisible and invisible, that have been part of these hundred years since the 19th Amendment uh, was passed. So uh, thank you uh, for writing the book. Thank you for joining us uh, on this conversation at Just the Right Book. We've been talking with Elizabeth Griffith the author of Formidable American Women and the Fight for Equality, 1920 to 2020. Thank you for listening.